So good evening, uh, as Charlie said. Uh, my name is uh, Luis Gordillo. I have been a faculty member in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics for since uh, 2012, and a member of the organizing uh, uh, committee of Science on Graph for four years or so, right? And uh, this year, we have a big celebration because it's the 10th anniversary of Science on Graph, so I will please. Come on. Yep. <laughs> and I, I am very thankful to our uh, fearless leader, uh, Professor Nancy Huntley, uh, and the organizing committee members, and special, especially to uh, Marianne Mufoleto for making things possible. Right? So the 10th anniversary suggested, that, uh, suggested us that uh, it would be fun to choose uh, the series year, the powers of 10, and, uh, which is the same title of the public lecture that I, I'm going to present over here, all right? Um, you can see, well, this is one of the flyers that uh, you have been on the TVs. And so we have planned a very interesting set of talks. The general idea is to invite you to think about how science explores the complexity of nature at different uh, physical scales. So, uh, putting aside my talk over here for a second, right? Uh, we can see that we are going to start from the, over here, the next talk, from the universe, very large cosmologic scale of structure and dynamics. And we will gradually descend into the quantum realm, all right? And uh, that is going to be the last talk in the in, in spring. So, of course, you may be wondering, right? Uh, let me take my, you may be wondering now, what is, uh, what is my talk going to be about, right? Because it doesn't seem to fit among these nicely put uh, titles. Right, powers of 10. So first let me tell you what this talk is not going to be about. So it's not going to be, you, you don't have to, to, to fear that it's going to be an elementary class of arithmetic, right? And, uh, and it's not going to be about history either, all right? I have to confess, however, that uh, it was difficult to determine uh, what I was going to talk about. Because, you see, in one hand, I know that a fraction of the public over here knows about powers of 10 because they learn in uh, high school and uh, still remember, right? But another fraction, uh, the not so experts, let's say, either forgot what they learned in high school or perhaps you are too young to know about them, right? So how can I say something without making the first group to fall asleep and simultaneously to not annoy the second group? That was the question, right? So I decided to start exploring this, this question over here. Can we trust our perception about the very large and very small? Of course, those uh, words over there are written in quotes because there are, they are uh, relative concepts, right? Uh, we're going to discover that simple arithmetic, meaning adding and multiplying numbers, can help us. So I have divided this talk in seven parts, and each of these parts has its own uh, taste. Because you see, I was uh, thinking, what would uh, us normally do on a Friday at 7 p.m. if we don't go to a science on grab? Well, we we'll go to a dinner, right? So I divided this talk in uh, courses, kind of, all right? <laughs> so let me give you the first course of tonight, right? So we are going to start with some examples. A word of warning. I grabbed these examples from the news in internet, the real news, all right? <laughs> this, means that, uh, this means that I am not an expert, all right, on these topics. And I put these examples together just because they incorporate some interesting numbers that will illustrate the point that I am trying to do, all right? So, <clears throat> Okay, so uh, the question again in this part is are we good perceiving uh, big and small numbers? 
So you see over there is a, uh, actually it's a video, but uh, this image over here is, is a Camp Nou, is, a, is a, the largest uh, stadium for soccer in Europe, and it belongs to the football club Barcelona. So I would like, to, uh, what are you are going to see? Let me tell you what you're going to see. Uh, you're going to see uh, people performing what's called the Mexican wave. Mexican wave was invented in the, in the World Cup uh, soccer in 1986 in Mexico, so people just stands and then sits. And then it creates this wave around the stadium, all right? And I, I decided to put this video because the person is taking a look at the wave, but it's, uh, it's just uh, recording the whole stadium. And the question, which is directed to the individuals here that are not familiar with the sports, right? And I will tell you why. The question is, can you estimate how many people is in this stadium? And of course, in, if you know about sports, perhaps you have seen watch uh, TV, you, you went to a stadium, you have an idea. If you know, please don't say anything, <laughs> right? And let the others guess, all right? So let me, <coughs> let me play the video over here. It's, it's, it's qu quick, okay? You can see the, the wave over there. Oops. You can see they have a complete view of the stadium, right? There the way comes. <laughs> all right, all right, okay. Okay, that's the thing. So, guess how many people is in that stadium? 90,000, okay. 200,000, good guess. Somebody else? 25,000. Yes? 130,000. In back? 100,000. Okay, very good. All of your, all these uh, answers are valid answers. In the sense that uh, you have all the right to, to give your guesses in that sense. Let me give you the, the, the real number, right? The capacity of this stadium is 99,000. So if you say that 100,000 is fine, okay? Now, um, when I saw this for the first time, I thought, hey, perhaps there's 25,000 people over there, right? So if you, th if you said 100,000, well, why not 110,000? Why not 80,000, right? Why not? Where did you base your your, your, your guess, how did you do it, okay? So there's, there's a big problem over here because it is, this is a big number, right? And we every day, or RAIN, is not trained to deal with these big numbers. So we really don't know, right? We could have said, well, why not 200,000, right? So we are really useless at estimating large numbers of people unless we are familiar with large crowds. So in this case, I would, uh, would be in a skeptic side if someone cli claims that uh, has seen a very large number, number of people, like, I don't know, one million or two million perhaps, because imagine, a million people would be 10 times the people that is in this stadium. So imagine this is stadium 10 times you have to build. That would be a, a lot of people, right? All right, so that's the first example. Next fastest computer in the world. All right, so th there's a new record, and if you're a computer geek, you, for sure you know that uh, the Oak Ridge National Lab, located in Tennessee, uh, uh, has the, the record, they broke it in, in, during the summer, which was held by China for several years. So um, let me tell you an anecdote about my mother over here. So I went to my mom, right? Well, you have to understand, my mom is, was born in a very, very small town in the middle of nowhere in a third world country. So I, so I asked her, hey mom, uh, could you guess how many arithmetic uh, operations can make a computer, the fastest computer in the world, all right? Just give me a number, guess. 
And she kept thinking, mm, the fastest one? Yes. OK, I said, 10. <laughs> she said, and I said, OK. I, said, so I think that the computer makes 10, 10 computations in a second. That's a lot. Well, uh, it happens that the fastest computer it produces two exaflops computations. So a flop is a floating point operations per second, all right? And it's two exaflops. Well, well, but what is that, two exaflops? Well, in numbers, it's going to be a two followed by 18 zeros, OK? So that's kind of large, all right? And, and you see, we can think, you can visualize the number, two with 18 zeros. But can we, can we really understand how big is that? We can't. We can, right? We know that it's a large number, but it's really hard to understand that. So let's move to the next example, right? The virosphere. And uh, virosphere is, uh, with this work, we refer to all the areas of Earth where viruses exist and which are affected, uh, and, and these uh, areas are affected by, by viruses, right? So I have to tell you the truth is I didn't know about this word until I was preparing this talk, right? So uh, it happens that viruses are the most abundant entities on Earth, right? So imagine, I, want, I would like you to imagine just standing in a one square meter, right? And I would like you to, to think and try to guess how many viruses do you think are landing onto you every day? All right. Of course, my first reaction when I was thinking about this is, well, I suppose that there should not be people dismissing around me, right? <laughs> but, uh, but think for a second. Give me, give me a guess. An X of one. An X of one. <laughs> 100,000. OK, another, another guess somewhere, somebody? Ten. All right. Very good. <laughs> okay, I will give you a hint. And again, this thing is a, is a piece that I extracted from from the news. Okay, so it's not a specialized literature or nothing. So this was in a, a news from in April. Oh, here is the the, the date. It's April 13, and the New York Times. It says trillions upon trillions of viruses fall from the sky from the sky each day. Right. So actually, the number is right here. 800 million of viruses fall into each square meter of the planet every day. 800 million, all right? That's a kind of a large number, right? And you didn't imagine, right? I didn't imagine either. I was thinking, well, if somebody is not sick around, perhaps not too many, <laughs> okay? But there are, there are a lot, a lot of viruses in, in, the, in the atmosphere, and they are just falling, okay? Of course, not all of them are, are bad for us. I mean, they are good. They are uh, very important in the, in the ecosystem, all right? Okay, let's continue. Let me present you uh, another example, and it, this is regarding atomic clocks. So, uh, again, what came to my mind in with a, a clock with a pendulum. It's these old clocks, you know, these very tall, but they have a pendulum moving from one side to the other, like clock, 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 the pendulum. Right, so atomic clocks do not have that kind of pendulum, but they have an atomic pendulum, meaning an oscillator, right? So this oscillator performs swings 500 trillion times per second. Yeah, like right now. Five trillion times of oscillations. That's just unbelievable, right? How large this, this number is. And not only that, but atomic clocks measure fractions of effects of a second out of 19 decimal places. So that's just, uh, it's really hard to simulate that kind of information, right? Mm. Again, uh, this is, uh, all these things that I'm telling you, you can just go and, uh, and take a look on the internet. This uh, was information was extracted from this uh, article in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. And this is also, I think it's in April or June, more or less. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, no, 
Okay. All right. So let's continue. So now that we have seen uh, these examples of very large and very small numbers that challenge our natural perception of things, right? Um, the question is, how do we efficiently operate with such numbers? Because they are super big. I mean, you cannot imagine scientists writing just pages and pages of zeros in decimals, right? That, is, that makes no sense, all right? So with this, let me introduce you the second course of tonight, right? So the idea in this part, in this part of the talk, is that uh, to put every member of the audience on the same page right, regarding the notation. So I will just quickly explain to you what powers of numbers and exponents are, right? So powers of numbers are just the result uh, when you have a number, a fixed number, and you multiply by itself over and over again, right? Like, for instance, you take number two, right? Uh, two is just the first power of two. If you multiply two two times, it's the second power of two. If you multiply two three times, it's the third power of two. And that's all. That's a power, all right? Now, of course, you can do that uh, uh, with uh, more times. Like, what's the 11th power of 2? And here it is, 11 number 2s. But that's a very long string of characters. So what we do is that we just simplify the notation. And we write, uh, let me put a pointer over here. And we write this. So we put 2, and this superscript over here, 11, is the number of times that we are multiplying 2 by itself, right? And of course, this thing applies not only to 2, but uh, to any number, in particular to number 10. We use number 10 because, well, that's the base that we use for counting. And that's because we have 10 fingers, right? That's the whole reason, right? So going back to the examples, uh, we have 100,000 people in the stadium it is just going to be 10 with exponent 5 people. So that's, this 5 is the number of zeros. One exaflop is going to be 10 and then the exponent 18, right? Which is 18 is the number of zeros. 800 million viruses. Well, it's 800 and then you have six zeros. Now, here what happened is that I'm going to take these two zeros and put them with the six zeros over here. So we have 8 times 10 with exponent 8 viruses, all right? Finally, let's just take a look at what are uh, negative exponents, like this one over here. 10 with exponent negative 2, what does it mean? Well, that's just the reciprocal of 10 with exponent 2, all right? So this is the explanation. So that means that it's 1 over 10 with exponent 2, which is 1 over 100, which is just 0 0.01, right? And, and that's all. That's all about powers and exponents that you have to understand for tonight, OK? So third part, third course. So let us see now how this notation is used in some cool examples, right? Let's go back to the atomic clocks, right? So again, there's another article over here. And it's dated uh, April 16, right? Um, a atomic clock. So there's an international network of synchronized atomic uh, clocks that has an accuracy of 10 to the negative 9 seconds per day. So that, this is the error of this network of clocks, right? So that means that 10 to the exponent negative 9 is 1 over 10 to the 9, right? So it will be 0 0.8 zeros and number 1 over there, all right? So that's kind of accurate. You will say, hey, why do we want uh, these uh, very accurate uh, clocks? I mean, it, it really doesn't matter. I mean, it's so small. Well, let me tell you another example, which is not that fun, but I think it's important. So it's a Patriot missile failure of 1991. So the picture that you are looking over there is a picture of the Scud missile. So this Scud missile is a very old missile that was produced in the Soviet Union. And it's kind of inf infamous because, you see, Egypt, 
sold one of these uh, missiles to North Korea. They made uh, back engineering on it, and, and then they made a lot of new modifications, and they now have these uh, missiles that can go to another continent. So all the trouble that we have heard on the news. So everything came with this, this fella over here. So what happened is that during the Gulf uh, War, one of these uh, missiles was uh, shot from Iraq to Arabia. And of course, what happened, uh, the idea is that you can intercept these kind of missiles, right? So uh, uh, the United States has the Patriot missile, right, which is right there. So um, the point is that the Patriot missile was unable to intercept successfully the Scud, and there were some casualties. And what, is, what, is that, what happened in, in this story is that uh, there was an error in the internal clock of the Patriot missile. And this error was this number that is right here. 9.5 times 10 to the exponent negative 8 every one-tenth of a second. So that's extremely small, right? And you may say, well, that, that, that doesn't sound like much. But what happened is that the internal clock of this missile was already working for 100 hours. So there was an accumulated error, right? And that ended up in being one-third of a second, 0 0.34 seconds. But still, you can say, but that's very small. That's very small. Well, problem is that this code uh, travels at a speed of uh, 1,676 meters per second. So it's quite fast, right? So in one third of a second, this missile is going to travel more than half of a kilometer. So it, the, the Patriot missile actually failed to catch it, right? So this was back in 91, and uh, you see uh, these numbers, the, the point of this, of this, uh, of this uh, putting this example over here is that the small errors matter. And these small errors have to be uh, expressed using this notation that I just talked to you some minutes ago. All right? Okay. So let's move forward. The fourth course of tonight. So we are going to try to make some, some, to have some fun making estimations. And why is that? So how can we put very large or very small numbers in a different context? And uh, why would, would we like to do that, right? Because if we have a very large number, we will try to relate this very big number with something that is more familiar to us. And we could perhaps understand better these very large or very small numbers, all right? So let's start with this question. How much water does the Bear Lake have? Well, yes, I know, a lot, all right? And you see there's a beautiful picture of the Bear Lake over there. And you see lots of water. And under that water, there's more water. <laughs> OK, <laughs> all right. So if you go and check in Wikipedia like I did, <laughs> right, you are going to find that uh, the water volume of Bird Lake is 8.02 cubic kilometers of water. And you say, hmm, yes, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> really? How big? How big? Can you imagine one cubic kilometer? Oh. All right, so I thought, okay, I know more or less one, cubic, uh, one kilometer, so I put one dimension, and then I would put one kilometer up, and then one kilometer this. That's a big cube, right? Now, eight of these, uh, okay, the things become a little bit harder, right? So the fun of making estimations, again, is that you can uh, manipulate these numbers and uh, try to relate to something else that uh, perhaps will be more fun and, uh, and will allow you to understand better, all right? So, suppose the inhabitants of Logan will use the volume of water contained in the lake. So we change the question. How long would it take to exhaust it, right? Of course, we assume that there's, there are no other sinks or sources to, to the lake, right? <coughs> Just that amount of water. So when you uh, have this kind of problem, of course, you need some preliminary information, right? In this case, you are going to need 
uh, what is the population of Logan? And that has to be, not, doesn't have to be exact, just an approximation. And it's 50,000 people that live in this town, right? So it's five times 10 uh, with exponent four, right over here. Next, it's, uh, you have to approximate the monthly use of water per habitant, which happens to be this number over here, 8,520 gallons per month, in average. You can also get this information from, from internet, right? So this is more or less. Finally, you need to know what is the re re relation between one gallon and uh, one cubic kilometer, right? And again, you have this number over here, right? So 3.79 times 10 with exponent to the negative 12. And then you can just make computations. So you have the number of uh, people, the amount of uh, water that is consumed by one individual per month, and then these two numbers relate just the units, make just ch changes the units to years and cubic kilometers. And it happens that in one year in Logan, in average, this number 1.9 times 10 to the negative two kilo cubic kilometers of water is the consumption, all right? And then what, what should we do with this number? Well, then we just take over here, where you see where the laser pointer is, 8.2, 8.02 is the volume of the lake, and this is the, the rate of consumption, right, that we just computed, okay? So that gives you 420 years, all right? So if we were just taking and expanding the water of from Bear Lake every day, it will take us 420 years to dry it, okay? So that's a better idea of how much water is there rather than eight cubic kilometers, okay? All right, let me give you another example. All right, how fast is 430,000 miles per hour? Well, of course, you may, may ask now, why are you asking that? All right. <laughs> why? But why not 500,000? Why not a million miles per hour? So if you are an enthusiastic about the space exploration, perhaps you know what uh, is related to this number. Somebody? The speed of light. The speed of light. Um, uh, no, light is faster than that, but good try. I like that. All right, okay. So that's the speed of NASA's Parker Solar Probe that was launched, launched, uh, launched the last month, right? The mission of this probe is to go to the sun and grab some information from the sun corona and we will finally know better what the sun does, okay? <laughs> All right. Um, and of course, this is a very big number, right? 430,000 miles per hour. So you can say, okay, I want to relate these, oh, by the way, this is the fastest human-made uh, object in, that has been created, all right? Okay, so how, I want to relate this number to something that is more familiar to my environment, something that I can, it, it would be better for me for understanding how fast is this. So one question could be, how many times can you travel to Salt Lake City and come back at that speed in two hours, all right? <laughs> but uh, I didn't do that, right? <laughs> So I, I, I rather th thought, okay, suppose that uh, we're here in Science on Grad, and then uh, we have this probe over here, and then we say, okay, circumvent the globe, go. <laughs> All right, so go around the Earth. So, well, this is, so I thought, okay, so how long is it going to take to go around the Earth <coughs> to this probe, to that speed? So that's very easy because we know there's some information, like the diameter of Earth. Right, it's 7.9 times 10 uh, exponent three miles. So we multiply by pi and we get the circumference of Earth, right? So now a very easy cal calculation is just uh, the probe will circumvent the planet and we have um, 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 that's over here. Oh, okay, so here is the speed, right? And this is the circumference in miles. So that gives you 5.8 times 10 power negative 2 hours 
which is essentially 3.5 minutes, all right? So the thing, since I started this, ex this example, the thing just came back and just gave, when, uh, went around the, the earth and came back, all right? So it's kind of quick, <laughs> all right? Okay? Okay, now, finally, the sixth course. So this part is completely different to the other parts I just presented. Uh, this is a piece of real mathematics. Surprisingly, you don't need to know any advanced arithmetic, right? Actually, you need to know nothing, almost, right? <laughs> almost nothing. So let's see how it goes. Because, you see, I'm a mathematician. And all the, 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 the examples that I have put here are only are related with uh, ecology and uh, physics. And, uh, but what about mathematics? What is big in mathematics? What is small in mathematics? Right? So let's try to, to talk a little bit about that. Okay. So let me tell you something about the set of, real, of natural numbers. Natural numbers, the numbers that you used to count. One, two, three, four, and so on. All right? So this set of numbers is not finite. What do I mean with that? So somebody asked me just some minutes ago, what is the largest number that you have imagined? OK, well, that's the question that I'm asking to you, right? Imagine a number, any number, the largest number that you can right now. OK, that's not the largest number, sorry. <laughs> you, just, you just add one, OK? And then you have a, even a larger number. And you can continue forever, all right? So that means the set of numbers is infinite, OK? You will never stop doing this. Okay, so <clears throat> that is kind of big in, in mathematics, right? Even a, a, every number as, uh, that you imagine, it doesn't matter how big it is, it's going to be small, okay? Because there's always something bigger. Now, there's another set of numbers that you're familiar with, the decimal numbers, right? I call them, I wrote over here real numbers, uh, but these numbers are just the decimal numbers, okay? They are also infinite. But this infinite is different than the infinite of the natural numbers. This new infinite is actually bigger. So what do I mean with this? Hmm, okay, let me try to explain you. Let's see how it goes. So think of all the numbers between zero and one, all the decimals between zero and one, okay? And we're going to make an assumption. Suppose that you can count them, all right? And what does it mean that you can count? Well, it means that you can make a list, right? First number, second number, third number, and so on, right? So consider such a list, and, uh, and uh, we, we, we express these numbers in the dec decimal expansions. And we could make a list, any list that comes to your mind. Each one of you could have a different order for the numbers. Like, for instance, you could say, oh, I, will, I decided I am going to number the numbers like this. 0 0.1, 0 0.12, 0 0.123, and so on. These points over here means that you just continue as long as you can or want, <laughs> all right? So that's an example of a list. This is another example of a list, right? You can say, hey, no, I don't like that order. I will choose this other one. One, two, three, four, five, and so on. And you, the thing will just grow and grow and grow, all right? And you can imagine, each, each one of you can, can choose whatever you want to do. Of course, I cannot uh, uh, deal with all the examples, so I will just write, write these things in a general form. So what I wrote over here is any list. I just replace the, the, the numbers with uh, letters. That's all, right? And there are these two numbers over here. The first number is going to mean what's the position in the list. And the other number is just the position in the number, digit, digit in the number, all right? And that's any, any, any of the orders uh, of the countings of the list that you imagine. And what happened is that I will choose a number, another decimal number, and just looking at the diagonal of uh, the list that you made, right? So the first, the, the point is this. The first digit in this new number is going to be chosen different 
than the first number in the diagonal. The second number is going to be chose different than the second number in the diagonal, and so on. So what is the result at the end? The result is that this number that I just created is different than all the numbers that are in your list, right? Because you are writing one digit that is different than from each one of them, OK? So that means you cannot count the numbers between 0 and 1, right? You have created a number that is outside. So that means simply that that the numbers, the, the decimal numbers between 0 and 1 uh, are larger in quantity than the natural numbers. You cannot count them. And that's a fantastic uh, result. And there are a couple of technicalities over there, but I am not going to say anything. I think the idea is just there. All right. The seventh course, of course, <laughs> in, a, in a decent uh, dinner is the dessert. So what are you taking home from this talk, right? So first of all, we noticed that it may be very difficult for humans to grasp uh, large and small numbers. I mean, it's very hard. We're useless making guess. Uh, we can express these quantities in a fancy way to facilitate calculations, which is the notation with the powers and the exponents, right? And you see, one of the goals of this uh, talk was trying to introduce you not only to the notation uh, for, that is going to be used in the, in, the, in, the, in the talks that are coming, right? Because the talks, each one of them, you see, are, are going to be at a different scales. So we have the, from the cosmological scale that we start to the quantum scale in the other side. And in the middle, we have, we're going to have uh, planetary, and then we're going to have um, micro and, and nano and so on, right? So for everybody over here, I, I want to show you something uh, that I didn't found. My wife did, right? And she said, hey, look, this, this uh, example is pretty cool. It's going to help everybody to, for the next, uh, for the next uh, talks. So it's number three, compare sizes and really try to understand different scales. So there are these uh, pretty cool uh, website um, that is called Universe Scale uh, that is supported by Nikon. So Nikon is one of the uh, big producers, famous producers of uh, lenses and cameras and telescopes and all that kind of stuff. So uh, my idea was to click over here and the, the thing will appear and you will see, but I did something better. I just had this page opened and I will show to you with, this, with my magic, all right, with my magic over here that I learned yesterday. Oops, no, it didn't work. Wait a second, wait a second. Just give me a second. I just want to push this in this side. And then I have to look. Where's my, oh, there it is. Uh, okay, all right. And then I will have to press here. Boom. OK. All right. OK. So you, you just put in Google uh, universe scale Nikon, and this thing is going to appear. Of course, there are some previous steps, like, uh, oh, there's a very nice music, and you know, blah, blah. And like you feel like you're floating in the space, and so on. But the point is that you can start just clicking uh, the meters, all right? So let's say we click over here. All right, so we have the comparison at uh, right scale. So you see these are squares, they are one meter, right? So we have the norm average size of a human, the average size of a turtle, and uh, there are many objects uh, to which you can compare with. And you see you're moving and moving and moving and moving. So you see now you are in this, in, in, you are moving to a place where the squares are uh, uh, 10 to the power to the exponent two, right? A hundred meters, and you can continue moving, and continue moving, continue moving, and now you are um, you start with 10 to the power three, that is one kilometer, all right? And you can go and go and go, <laughs> like for instance. Let me see. 
where is it? Over here. Oh, yes, look at the planet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now these little squares over here are 10 power 7 over here. Well, no, that's 10 power 6. 1,000 kilometers, right? OK? And uh, you can click, and uh, you will have the moon. And if you click in the moon, there you have information, and Mars, and the Earth, Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, the Earth, you see, very small, very small. Oh, man, look, the sun. <laughs> and, and you can continue. So this will be the planetary scale, right? And this LY over here, what does it mean? Light years, right? So I will not even touch that button there because I will take the fun from you away, and that's not fair. But let me just show you to the other side, right? So here we have centimeters, for instance. Oh, yeah, look at that. So we have 10 power uh, exponent negative 2. So this is one centimeter inside. And you can go uh, down and down and down and down. And you see you have fleas, you have uh, snow crystals, and you can go down, go down, go down. And you see that more and more things begin to appear over there. So again, I will not spoil the extreme over there because it will continue going down. So it's for you to explore and have fun, OK? All right, now, uh, uh, remember, uh, you can just Google that thing, just uh, put in universe scale. So before you come to one of the talks uh, during this year, you can say, oh, nano, nano scale. Let's take a look what is comparable with that, all right? Oh, the, the next is a planetary scale. Let's see what is comparable with that scale, all right? Because you see, what you have to do uh, to be able to understand the dynamics and how nature works is that you, your brain has to be able to jump from scale to scale, right? The dynamics are different. Okay. Finally, if you really don't like any of these things, I have something for you. So if you have trouble sleeping, you can start estimating quantities, right? <laughs> By just looking things around you. So here are some questions. You can make up your own questions. I mean, you see all these examples I just grabbed from the, from the internet, from the news. So first, how many cells are in your body? Ah, you have to estimate that, right? A lot, yeah, how, how many? How many nerve endings does your skin have? I have a hint over here. Square inch has approximately 1,000. So that means that you will have first to estimate how much skin do you have, right? What is the diameter of the sun? If you know that the sun is 9.3 times 10 exponent 7 miles away from us. And finally, the gross example. How many people around the world is poking their noses right now? OK. So, of course, when you finish a dinner, you have an after dinner, but we are going to have after activities right outside, uh, which are pretty fun. I invite you to, to visit those. And, uh, and finally, thank you for your patience, and have a great night. All right. Thanks.